a shakeup in the Kansas Senate race on the Republican side. Does this hurt or help Democrats' chances at stealing the seat? Plus, a governor's veto ripples across the state as counties have to decide for themselves how to handle the pandemic. And have you gotten one of these? Mail-in ballot applications are going out, but not everyone's happy about it. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. Southwest National Bank has proudly served Wichita and its surrounding communities for over 100 years. We are happy to support KPTS, public television for Kansas. Continuing coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic in Kansas is funded in part by a grant from the Facebook Journalism Project Community Network Grant Program run in partnership with the Linfest Institute for Journalism and the Local Media Association. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. It may not seem like it, but the 2020 election is getting revved up. Kansas counties are already sending you mail-in ballot requests for the August primary. And with pandemic-related public health concerns, the Wichita Eagles says in two counties, Johnson and Sedgwick, more than 20% of registered voters have already filled those applications out and turned them in. In the next few days, the state expects the number of requests to surpass that of 2016's total. All of this despite protests from some Republicans saying mail-in ballots are not safe. Kansas Secretary of State told me it's a tried and true practice here in Kansas in this special report that aired on Cake News. This scene says election day to most of us, much more so than this. But as we told you last month, the state of Kansas is pushing for more mail-in balloting to help cut down on crowds and the number of poll workers they'll need during the pandemic. If you're scared to go out, don't use that as a reason not to vote. You can mail-in vote. More and more people are voicing concerns about the safety of mail-in balloting. From the White House. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. To those memes popping up all over on social media. I've seen a little bit about it on social media. Kansas voters like Madeline Stevens are paying attention. Do you have any concerns about security with it? Uh, um, I could see how it could be an issue, yeah. Kansas is not a high cheat state. And Kansas Secretary of State Scott Schwab says mail-in balloting is old hat here with plenty of security measures built in. First, you actually have to apply for a mail-in ballot. Part of that application includes your state ID number. That's so they have access to an official copy of your signature. You have to sign that envelope. Sign the envelope. I'm going to say again, sign the envelope. Election officials then match up the signature on the envelope to your official signature. No match or no signature, and they'll call you to find out what's going on. Once your ballot is in the mail, the post office takes over security. The U.S. Postmaster tells Cake News Investigates they know every moment of where your ballot is at, from the mailbox to the election office. If you're still worried about your vote getting lost in the mail, you can always bring it straight to the election office to drop it off. A lot of county clerks actually put outside their elections office a drop box, sort of like a security drop box if you were to do a night deposit. As for those worries about fake votes, Schwab says the best way to fight them is to get more Kansans to the polls. So if you have three people cheating, but three million voting, those three people really don't affect the outcome of, it, of an election that much. That's what Stevens plans on doing. Though she'll still vote in person, she sees no problem with mail-in ballots when properly secured and delivered. You know, voting by mail is a right that we have. People can do it. And here to help me parse this all out, we have Suzanne Tobias, opinion editor from the Wichita Eagle, joining us. And by Skype, political scientist Dr. Russell Arbin Fox from Friends University. Thank you both so much for being here. Thanks. All right. So yeah. as we dig into this issue, it's certainly what everybody is talking about right now, no matter where you fall on the topic. Right. I, I mean, there's a lot of national, obviously national conversation mm -hmm. about it. But here in Kansas, I mean, I think people are very comfortable with mail-in voting. We've had it for a long time. As your segment showed, people, you know, I think the, one of the, the best reasons to uh, to think that mail-in voting is is not all that bad is just to look just at this past Democratic primary and um, the success that they had with, with mail-in ballots for that. Their turnout was way up. Um, we don't see a lot of the, the fraudulent claims that, that you know, people are, are bandying about nationally. So, Russell, I'm going to toss this over to you. I you know, uh, the Secretary of State said this is not a high cheat, cheat state. We're not seeing the same number of fraudulent claims maybe in other states. Why are we seeing some high-level Republicans really saying they don't like 
the counties sending out applications to everybody? Well, the primary reason why we're seeing this is because there is a widely held belief that if you go to um, universal mail-in ballots, which we would not have here in Kansas, they're simply talking about uh, making it easier for people to request uh, absentee ballots and making other sorts of arrangements. We're not talking about setting up something like they have in Washington State or Oregon, where every single citizen automatically receives a mail-in ballot. Um, their concern is that if you take a step towards that kind of universal mail-in voting approach, you're going to be greatly increasing the voter pool, including people that maybe don't normally vote, low-income people, uh, college students. And the feeling is, of course, that a lot of those people will tend to vote for the Democratic Party, and so consequently, the Republican Party doesn't want it. I should emphasize that the data on this is not really all that clear. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that uh, mail-in balloting does increase access and it does increase overall turnout. But it's not clear that it's a kind of a, a, a clear slam dunk for the Democratic Party. Still, that's the assumption that a lot of Republicans hold. And so that's the primary reason you see a lot of Republicans fighting against this practice, which has been entirely normalized in a lot of place, places around the country. Uh, Secretary of State Scott Schwab said very much the same about the data, that there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but not a whole lot of firm numbers. But we do have some firm numbers, though, of Kansans wanting this. The numbers are up big time. Well, and that's no surprise given our the, the pandemic situation mm -hmm. right now. I mean, it's just sort of the perfect storm of, you know, people still want to vote and they still want their voice heard. And because people are more comfortable with, with mail-in balloting here, at least they know it's been around. I personally like to go to the, the polls on election day. I just, you know, this year I don't know what I'm going to do. I, you know, I still, it's, you know, I don't want to endanger anyone by, you know, being part of a long line at a polling place. So I think people have a lot to weigh when they're talking about how to vote this year. But I think that generally, yes, I mean, there's a huge demand for mail-in ballots. Well, and there's also, uh, Russell, a lot of talk about how the, you, we've got this little bubble and you're not going to change anybody's mind. So people kind of think what they think, and that's probably not going to change between now and Election Day about this. Well, I mean, even if no minds did change, you're only going to see at the very most uh, some rather marginal efforts taken one way or another in terms of access to mail-in ballots to really set up the sort of thing that uh, some Republicans are laying out there as a boogeyman would take months, if not years. You've got to entirely change the way you staff uh, the uh, county offices that receive ballots and that count ballots. You've got to set up a lot of technology and infrastructure to be able to handle the number of ballots that are received by mail. I mean, right now in most states, including here in the state of Kansas, this is a, a tempest in a teapot. Now that doesn't mean that you can't get a lot of people, you know, building up a huge head of steam arguing about it because, you know, if they see a tiny advantage to their opposing party, they're gonna fight it tooth and nail. But broadly speaking, we here in Kansas are still a long ways away from being able to make the sort of really dramatic changes that mail-in balloting can potentially promise. All right. Well, mail-in balloting wasn't the only thing people were talking about this week. The other big news, the governor's veto of a mega bill that lawmakers passed on their last day at the state house, sort of. The bill covered many different topics that were COVID related, including limiting the governor's powers during an emergency and putting into law all the changes she made through executive orders. Lawmakers say this veto is likely to lead to lawsuits, although they disagree on how and why. When lawmakers called it quits Friday morning, some eight hours after the last day of the session was supposed to end, veterans like Representative Jim Ward were already predicting they would be back soon. The argument is at midnight, the light switch went off. So if you kept working in the dark, it doesn't matter because there's no power. Ward believes any bill passed after midnight won't pass a legal challenge. Just one of many legal battles he and others expect to come. 
we will clearly be in a constitutional crisis. That was Senate President Susan Wagle just hours before the governor's announcement. She believes the governor has overstepped her powers with her handling of the pandemic. She can't create new crimes. Uh, she can't rewrite our statutes when she uh, issues an emergency order. Wagle orchestrated the push to limit some, Kelly's powers. Okay. She says expect a lot of lawsuits Senate in the coming days and weeks over both the governor's the emergency counter, declarations and her executive Kelly orders. Kelly. That's something Ward agrees with her on, but he expects the facts of the pandemic will fall in the governor's favor. We get all caught up in the Topeka and under the dome, but for people of Kansas, the emergency still exists and the governor is taking steps to protect him. And something that a lot of people are talking about, should her powers be limited? Should, did she overstep her bounds? But what it comes down to is there's some major changes. And one of those biggest changes is a special session next week. Yes, uh, which was going to be is a surprise to everyone because they truly thought they were going to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they would not have, <laughs> I don't think, worked through the night and passed uh, yeah. legislation at 8 a.m. But, you know, I, I talked to Governor Kelly uh, just the day after or the day that that vote, the, the, later in the morning that that, <laughs> that that vote was taken. And she uh, was did not know whether she would veto or not at that point, but was very clear in saying you don't do a lot of great lawmaking under those conditions. And I think that, I, you know, I mean, it's, it was rushed, it was panicked, it was, you know, no one really had it. the text of the bill before they yeah, I passed had, it. <laughs> I got it from another uh, reporter and then was able to pass on via Twitter to lawmakers because right. they hadn't even seen it yeah. yet. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, everyone was a little confused. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually maybe good that the legislature is going to actually come back and maybe try and, try and straighten some of this out. They're obviously going to try and override her veto. We'll see if they have the votes for that. It's not looking that way. Yeah. But we'll see. <laughs> Lots of we'll sees about yes. this situation, definitely. <laughs> sure. Russell, as we talk about this issue, is it surprising that the handling of the pandemic turned political so quickly in Kansas? No, it's turned political all across the United States. And this is partly because of the messaging that has come out of the White House where uh, President Trump has encouraged people to uh, pick sides in various uh, ginned up battles over masks or other over other restrictions. And he's done so in ways that reflect whether or not the governor in a particular state is a Republican or a Democrat. To be fair, there are a lot of genuinely difficult issues at work here. Uh, we have problems trying to figure out exactly where authority lies, how much lies with states, how much lies with counties, how much lies with the national government. Questions about this authority is very much tied to money that the federal government is providing and the sorts of programs that that money might be able to use to help fund. You also have a lot of real confusion over how you're going to exercise any of this power. The fact that our attorney general has issued a opinion that he's not actually sure that the governor can use police powers to enforce anything that she's declared, but he hasn't done this in connection with any actual case. It's just kind of an opinion he threw out there. That's the sort of thing that's just muddying the waters even more. So, I mean, yes, it turning into a political slugfest was probably predictable. I would actually kind of disagree a little bit with uh, Suzanne there. I I'm sure that a lot of legislators really did hope that the 24 hour session was gonna be the end. But I think that by the time they were all of a half hour into it, they kind of saw where this was going to be going. And a lot of them early on were predicting this is going to crash and burn and the governor is going to have to call a special session anyway. Well, one of the things they're going to be talking about when the governor calls a special session is what happened when she issued her veto. She also announced she was returning the decision of how to handle the pandemic to local county commissions with a recommend recommendation. They continue to follow the guidelines for reopening that she had set out in her ad Astra plan. County decisions on that have been split as Hunter Funk from KSN News and Bree Smith from Cake News show us. Rural communities in southwestern Kansas with the most positive coronavirus cases in the state. 
The KDHE confirms more than 1,400 people have the virus in Finney County. Larry Jones is a longtime resident of the area and sits on the county commission. We just need to get our economy back up and running. Um, we don't work very good out here without uh, jobs, and, and our stores were closed, and our sales tax revenue was off. Last week, the board voted to keep the county in phase 1.5 until at least the end of this month. While Jones is ready to move on to phase 2 of Governor Kelly's plan, some other board members like Dewan Drees are hesitant. The numbers still are saying 47, 48, 49 percent tested coming back positive. So. We are far from the 20% statewide average. Governor Kelly announced this week she'll be lifting most of the COVID-19 orders and giving the control back to the counties. So businesses like this in Wichita can take steps to safely and completely reopen. The restrictions are gone in Sedgwick County, but as commissioners say, that doesn't mean everything's back to normal. It's time to, to allow this to take the next step. Changing restrictions to recommendations. That's what was approved by commissioners. But they can open today under their own under their own world. What does that mean? Pools, large venues, bars and nightclubs, and any other business that's been closed by the restrictions from the governor's reopening plan now are no longer enforced. We'll, we'll still track what's going on. If we see some big changes in what's going on, uh, we can always uh, change our guidance. Uh, we can change it to no longer guidance to, to uh, regulation. And a lot of confusion there that we're talking about in even more as you look at counties that are right next to each other. Pete Meissner had earlier said that he had issues with Sedgwick County had tight restrictions and Butler County did not And so folks from Wichita were going over to Augusta to do business. Right. That was a that was a clear throughout mm -hmm. uh, the restrictions and throughout the stay at home yeah. orders and all of that. I mean, but he was also uh, Meitzner and the county commissioners. A lot of them were looking to Johnson County for um, advice on, mm -hmm. on how to how to go move forward after that veto. Uh, and but essentially I mean, what they did was you know, open it back up. I mean, mm -hmm. I know they like to say they like to say that it's uh, these recommendations are, you know, we, we really think you should avoid crowds of over 20 people. I mean, they had that in their, you know, recommendation, but essentially what they did was put the governor's plan on their website for people who choose to follow it. Um, for all intents and purposes, everything in Kansas, at least in Cedric County, is is open for business. There are lots of bars and clubs opening this weekend with back to, you know, back to business special, yeah. drink specials and everything else. So we'll see how this goes, I guess. Yeah. And talking about those bars and clubs opening without recommendations, some are saying no to the recommendations. Others are saying yes. It's very confusing. And who knows what's going to happen next? KSN's Alexis Padilla speaks to some about the decisions they made. With power washers in hand and music playing, some businesses in Old Town are prepping to reopen. Like Heroes Sports Bar and Grill, they will open their club this weekend. So many phone calls every day asking if we, if we open our regular hours. I mean, people get frustrated already. Heroes plans to limit the crowd and encourage six feet distancing. But ultimately, Heroes manager Mike Mansour says it's up to the people. It is a need to make their own choices. It's time. It's two months. We can't just be telling people to stay at home for the whole year. While some businesses are ready to open their doors this weekend, Fever Nightlife is waiting an additional week to make sure all their safety precautions are in place. We've kind of trained everybody to stay at home, so now it's going to be retraining them uh, to come to a place that they not only love, but they also trust. That trust comes with hand sanitizer, gloves, and a tool to make sure the only fever is the name outside. We're going to be doing temperature checks at the door with a camera that checks your temperature. Um, that's not quite in yet, so that's uh, one of the reasons why we're delaying to opening up. Overall, managers are ready to see Old Town come back to life. It's been dead for over two months. I can't wait to see it booming back up because this is our economy. This is everybody's job. This is how we, we will survive. Alexis Padilla, KSN News 3. And the mayor of Wichita has raised concerns about this back and forth. Russell, I'm going to go back to you. This is hard when you're talking about local county and city leaders wanting to go in different directions. Yeah, I mean, and on one level, you could simply argue that this is uh, a characteristic of American federalism and the fact that we, you know, di divide sovereign authority between the national level, the state level, and, you know, regional county governments. But 
the fact of this divide really doesn't get to the heart of the confusion. The heart of the confusion, at least in my perspective and the perspective of a lot of other people who study this, is the fact that the United States of America has an overwhelmingly urban population. Uh, 80% of the U.S. population lives in cities, some more in some states, some less in other states. But cities, by and large, are bypassed when it comes to making these sorts of decisions. Most of the authority when it comes to public health matters are placed in the hands of county commissions. Sometimes you see county commissions handling this very well, working with city leaders, taking into consideration the different issues of diversity and uh, economy that come up in urban versus rural areas. Other times you don't see county leaders uh, really kind of stepping up and recognizing the complexity of the situation that faces them. So I, I, I think that the primary source of this confusion, which extends obviously all across the country, can be found in the simple fact that on the ground, on the local level, you have county leaders and you have city leaders that sometimes are at cross purposes. Well, and certainly here in uh, Sedgwick County, we have a fairly long history of the county and the city working fairly closely together on a lot of issues, but they did split on this one. Right. I mean, uh, Wichita Mayor Brandon Whipple came out this week and said he was uh, very discouraged by what the county decided on Wednesday, wishes that there were more, there was more power in the hands of city leaders. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sedgwick County, even though, yeah, they're, they're county leaders, but Sedgwick County is an urban county. I mean, the, the vast majority of our population is in the city of Wichita. But yeah, it, it's, it's a lot, it's very confusing to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, it'll be real interesting two weeks from now, you know, as, as some, you know, Commissioner Lacey Cruz was fond of saying, we'll know how this goes when we see the data two weeks from now. And hopefully, you know, maybe, you know, we can, we can curb the, the spread a little bit, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah, well, and, and while there are bars, nightclubs, other places like that that are choosing to open up now or in the next week. There are others that are saying, you know what, we're just going to wait and follow the Ad Astra plan. That's what's been really interesting to me is that it's not, I mean, it, while it is legally a free for all, it's real interesting to see that there are certain businesses who, who are either saying, A, I don't have my employees ready to go, or my employees feel very uncomfortable about getting back, or we're just doing fine with curbside or whatever. So there's, it's, you have to go on uh, Facebook or social media to see if your favorite place is open now because yeah. it's, we don't, you know, there are no regular hours. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Russell, you had a point you wanted to make? Just really quickly, following up on what Suzanne was saying, let's not forget the fact that these businesses are responding to customers. And while it is really easy to uh, take a look at Twitter and take a look at MSNBC and CNN and think, oh my gosh, everybody's protesting everywhere. The truth of the matter is, is that most polls suggest that there's something like 80% support across the country uh, for various stay at home and business closure orders. I think an awful lot of people are genuinely convinced of the seriousness of COVID-19. They are genuinely concerned about their health. And so a lot of businesses might have to take into consideration the fact that customers may not be really willing to come back. Okay. And they're going to want to see businesses that are taking it seriously and are taking it slowly. Obviously, that's not going to be all of them, but I suspect it will be more than you might at first anticipate. Yep, and we'll see that as the weeks go by. Well, believe it or not, we have some non-COVID related news to discuss today. A shakeup in the race for the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate seat that Pat Roberts is vacating. Hours after Kansans for Life announced it was endorsing Roger Marshall for the U.S. Senate, Kansas Senator Susan Wiggle dropped out of the race. As the Wichita Eagle reports, she had framed much of her campaign around passing an anti-abortion amendment to the Kansas Constitution this legislative session, something which didn't happen amid a fight over when to hold the public vote on that amendment and the pandemic interruption of the session. Wiggle pointed to concerns that a divided Republican electorate could boost Democrat Barbara Bollier's chances of winning the general election, saying, quote, I know Barbara well, and I will not be part of a primary fight that will divide our party or hurts my colleagues in the state legislature. Wiggle also said lingering rumors that Mike Pompeo would join the race hurt fundraising efforts and added the death of her daughter in March was a contributing factor. And Russell, I'm going to start straight with you on this as the political scientist. She mentioned several different uh, reasons. What do you think was the biggest factor in her decision? She never polled well once 
the party, once the field really got set, she had pushback from the party to drop out of the race to try and consolidate support behind Marshall, and she never did well fundraising. Right. Uh, all of those things are true. Uh, she struggled in matters of name recognition. She struggled in matters of raising money. Um, her game plan from the beginning was the constitutional amendment. This was going to be the way in which she was going to bring out to the August primary uh, a large number of pro-life voters that would be able to look at her as a champion. Well, COVID-19 effectively took apart that strategy of hers. And it was already clear because of what had happened in Topeka that that strategy of hers had fallen apart. When Kansans for Life endorsed Marshall, that was kind of just icing on the cake as far as her chances were concerned. So as we move forward, are you, as editor of the opinion page uh, in the Eagle, hearing much from the public about this this decision? Well, it, it was interesting how you introduced that segment as there is news beyond COVID because <laughs> we're not we're not really hearing a lot of that. But now, I mean, the filing deadline is is next week. Uh, there's still rumors that Pompeo is going to jump into this race. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> it's kind of looking doubtful, but I I'll, I won't uh, won't doubt it. Um, but yeah, we're I mean, it's going to get real interesting once the you know the the community starts to reopen and people are feeling a little bit more comfortable about sort of the measures moving forward health wise maybe they'll start thinking about politics but right now i mean there's not a lot of conversation about it i know that republican leaders uh advised many of the primary candidates to drop out because they wanted yeah. a clear you know clear path toward be beating bollier but um I, I guess maybe that's shaping up to their favor now well, actually, a clear path to beating Bollier or a clear path to beating Kobach? Well, <laughs> beating Kobach is beating Bollier, I think, <laughs> because Bollier has the greatest chance against Kobach. I mean, yeah. polls show that, you know, previous, uh, you know, elections show that. So, um, yeah, I think All that right. they want Marshall in that spot. Okay. Suzanne, Russell, thank you so much for joining us this week. We'd love to hear what you think about all of this. Find us on social media to continue the discussion. Look for Pilar Pedraza TV and KPTS Channel 8. For now, stay safe and have a great week. Southwest National Bank has proudly served Wichita and its surrounding communities for over 100 years. We are happy to support KPTS, public television for Kansas. Continuing coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic in Kansas is funded in part by a grant from the Facebook Journalism Project Community Network Grant Program, run in partnership with the Linfest Institute for Journalism and the Local Media Association.